Okay, you can open up your Bibles today to the book of 1 Peter. We are in chapter 2 to begin with, verse 17. And we will go through chapter 3, verse 18 today. And Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17. <clears throat> the Bible says, show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the king. And so there are different ways that we show proper respect to different people. One thing is for sure, we are to honor all people in the sense of showing the proper respect for them. We are to honor even an evil ruler like Nero, who, by the way, was the ruler in Peter's day, presided over the murder of countless Christians, including Peter and Paul. And yet, he says, honor the ruler. So even an evil ruler like Nero should be given proper honor. Honor Nero, but fear God, or reverence and worship God. And that would make a man like Nero angry, because he demanded worship. But God says, you give him honor, you give me worship. And so we are to honor all people in the proper way. Not in a way that dishonors God. And of course that means we're going to have to disappoint some people. And even upset some people who want more than they've got coming. They want a higher place in our lives perhaps than God. And they'll just have to be disappointed. 18. Slaves, submit yourselves to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. So, here we see that Christians really have a higher standard than most people live by. Christians must behave better than anyone because we belong to and we represent the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus did not spit back at those who spit on him. He died and paid for their sins. And we must not be bad to those who are bad to us, even if it's hard to hold back. We must act like Jesus, because he is in us, and because we must not rep misrepresent him. 19. For it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. But how is it to be how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. And so you know, people who do wrong deserve to be punished for the wrong that they do. It's not commendable to put up with that kind of punishment. God is not going to pat them on the back and say, well, nice job enduring your punishment. I commend you for, for suffering, for robbing a bank. No. But if we are treated badly for our faith, in other words, for doing what is right in the eyes of God, well then God, he will say, well done. You suffered for me, and you put up with that. And one well done from Jesus, even a, even a slight nod and a half a smile, would be more than enough reward for me anyway, for any amount of unjust suffering that I might have to put up with for being faithful to him. The thing is, the more difficult it is to obey God, you can bet the greater the reward will be. 21. Look at this. To this you were called, 
because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Jesus didn't do anything wrong, and yet he patiently endured suffering for us. Now it's our turn to follow his example. Now it's our turn. It is our calling. We are supposed to suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are supposed to endure it, even when it's unfair. We are called to endure it without complaint, because that's what Jesus did. Jesus did it for us, and now we are told to do it to him, or for him. 21 and 22. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. The Bible says that Jesus came to take away our sin. He had no sin of his own, so he was able to be our perfect substitute sacrifice, the just for the unjust the righteous for the unrighteous, the Bible says, to lead us to God. 23. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He didn't retaliate. And he sure could have. With one word, Jesus could have killed and banished to hell every single person who spit on him who flogged him, who punched him, who mocked him, or who nailed him to the cross. It would not have been any problem at all for him to do that. Instead, he took it all and by that took the punishment for our sin. And he just left it all into the hands of God. He concentrated on what he knew the Father wanted him to do. And he knew that some of those people would get saved, and he knew that the rest would be dealt with on Judgment Day. He was concerned about doing the will of the Father. 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Now this is often taken out of context. By his wounds you have been healed. This is not talking about physical healing being in the atonement to the point where all you got to do is be anointed with oil and you can claim your healing in Jesus Christ because by his stripes or by his wounds you have been healed. So he already was beaten. He already suffered for your healing. So now it's all yours. All you have to do is receive it. Not true. Although ultimately our physical bodies will be raised from the dead and in perfect health because Jesus paid for those sins. So in that sense our healing was included in the atonement. But that's not what this is talking about. This is talk look at the context of this. Jesus suffered to pay for our sins. Jesus suffered to heal our souls from sin's damage and to set us free from sin. twenty five. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Sheep often wander off as they look for grass to eat. And they're not willfully rebellion, rebelling, they're just stupid. They're, they're mindless as they focus on the next blade of grass. You know, they're wandering further and further away. And they get lost as they wander. And again, without even realizing that they often put themselves in great danger. They look up all of a sudden and, hey, there's no one around except this wolf. And that's why the shepherd has to go looking for him and bring him back. Before people become Christians, they are like lost sheep. They wander around. Wander around looking for fulfillment, not realizing that they're in great danger. A heartbeat out of hell. Just wandering mindlessly, aimlessly, looking for the next thing to, you know, give them some fun or some fulfillment wandering around lost sheep wandering right on the edge of hell and they don't even know it chapter 3 wives in the same way be submissive to your own husbands so that 
If any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. A Christian woman will never win her non-Christian husband to the Lord by nagging. A Christian wife must be holy if she wants her husband to come to Christ. She must respect him. She must obey him. Unless he tells her to do something that is contrary to God's will, to Scripture. Then she's got to draw the line and say, Well, I can't do it. i got to obey God. But she should be holy. And she should be submissive. Her husband may not be holy. But he knows what holy is. And deep down he probably knows that it's right. And as his wife lives a quiet and godly life, the Holy Spirit can use that to convict her husband that that's the right way to go. And it may take a long time. And it may never happen at all. God doesn't give us any guarantees on this. But that is the best way to win a husband to Christ. And it's a hard ministry. But it's an important one. It's a hard ministry. It calls for deep devotion to Jesus Christ and endurance. Three, your beauty <clears throat> should not come from outward adornment, such as braided hair and the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Instead, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. You can't you can't win your husband to Jesus Christ or anybody else to Jesus Christ by your beautiful outward appearance. That doesn't do it. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. Physical beauty is nice, but spiritual beauty is more important. A loud, overbearing, contentious attitude in a woman is useless to God. It is useless to God, it is unattractive to any man of God, and it hurts the spread of the gospel. When God sees a Christian woman who is gentle and quiet and humble, he sees a beautiful woman. And spiritual beauty doesn't mean that a woman can't say what's on her mind. But it does mean that it should be said with a gentle spirit not in a contentious, overbearing, loud way. And I know that's not fashionable today, but God doesn't worry about that sort of thing. His standards do not change. Look at verse 5 and 6. For this is the way the holy women of the past... So, you know, it's always been this way. <clears throat> this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to make themselves beautiful. They were submissive to their own husbands, like Sarah who obeyed Abraham and called him her master. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Someone says, well, see, that was for the old days. No, God's standards for beauty, spiritual beauty, do not change with times or cultures. This is in Scripture. It doesn't have anything to do with cultures. 4,000 years ago, Sarah was beautiful to God because she respected her husband's authority and because she was godly. And the one time that she was contentious, the one time she gave Abraham a hard time, remember, she insisted that Abraham give her a son through Hagar, her servant. And Abraham acted like a fool and caved into her contention. And the world's been suffering for 4,000 years because of it. She did not act like a woman of God. He did not lead like a man of God. And the trouble was, or the result was trouble. And that's why these verses are so important for the world today. They are timeless. And so look at verse 5 one more time. For this is the way the holy women of the past. Notice holy women. 
of the past who put their hope in God used to make themselves beautiful. They were submissive to their own husbands. Any Christian man who is thinking about marrying an ungodly woman or a woman who will not let him lead without giving him a hard time, without being contentious about every little thing, any man who is thinking about marrying a woman like that has rocks in his head if he goes through with it. 7. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. The weaker partner speaks of physically weaker. We're on the same level, spiritually speaking. We're all one in Christ. But any husband who isn't good to his wife will answer to God for his behavior. God has given husbands the job of leader in the home. They are to lead. They are in charge. They are accountable to God. Husbands are responsible for what goes on in the home. If they do not treat their wife with respect, the respect that a child of God deserves, then their prayers will not be heard. If we create problems between us and other people, if we create problems between us and our spouses, then we create problems between us and God also. Look at 7 one more time. <clears throat> Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. A husband is commanded by God to try to understand his wife and be considerate to her. Treat her like you would treat Jesus. And so a husband must be good to his wife. If he is not, then he disobeys God. Eight, finally, all of you, live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be as compassionate. Be compassionate and humble. God does not want his children arguing. Instead, he wants them to sympathize with each other. Sympathize. Selfishness and pride cause arguments. Humility causes people to sympathize. Unless there is humility in place of pride and selfishness, people will not get along. 9. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. It's easy to be nice when people are nice to you. It's much harder when someone is mean or unreasonable. It's hard to be nice to somebody like that. It is natural to respond with evil to those who are being evil. But God does not want us to be natural. He wants us to be supernatural. He expects Christians to be like his son, who returned kindness for evil, not evil for evil. And if we want to be blessed, that's the way we got to be. And then he says in verse 10, For whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. So, you know, you're not going to love your life and you're not going to have good days if you don't keep your tongue from evil and you don't keep your lips from deceitful speech. And God certainly is not promising us a carefree life with no trouble when he says you're going to have good days. The good life for a Christian is to be right with God, is to be at peace with God is to be obedient even when it's not easy. That's the good life. That's when you have peace and joy. The good life is to have no regrets. Regrets from responding in the flesh instead of in the spirit or regrets from letting your sinful nature control your tongue. Those are regrets. Those steal good days. No one can love life 
and experience good days if they are willfully disobedient to God. 11. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. Christians must make a conscious choice to turn away from evil. And the reason that we have to make that decision to turn away from evil is because our sin nature naturally takes us in the direction of evil. So that original sin, from, from birth we have a natural bent toward evil. So we, that's why we have to make a decision to turn away from it. So to have a good life, Christians must must overcome bad things. Not by trying not to do bad, but by turning away from it and doing good. Doing good. Overcome evil with good. It's not a negative thing. Well, I'm going to stop doing this, I'm going to stop doing that. No, you, it's a positive thing. I'm going to start doing this good thing, and I'm going to start doing that good thing. 12. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. God listens to the prayers of those who obey him. He does not listen to the prayers of those who do not care about him. He does not listen to sinners who refuse to repent. He listens to those who worship him through obedience. 13. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. He says, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? Well, most people will appreciate those who do good things. Acts of kindness, anyway, are usually something that will cause people to like us. But doing good also means standing up for things that God says are right and standing opposed to the things that God says are wrong. That's part of doing good too. And that's when we can start rubbing some people the wrong way. When we live in a world that calls bad good and good bad, and you know we're not going to fit in very well. When we call good good and bad bad, we're going to rub some people the wrong way. And so that's why he says, but even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. Stand for what is right and stand for what is true and reject what is wrong and reject what is false, even when no one pats you on the back for it. Do it even when we suffer for it. It's a strange thing. But there is a deep joy that God gives to his people who suffer for doing what is right. It's like an, the next level of joy and peace. A Christian who compromises in order to be accepted by the world that doesn't honor God is going to be one miserable person. But there is joy and there's a special presence of God for Christians who suffer for doing what is right. 15. But in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. There's no doubt about it. Going all out for Jesus Christ will result in some form of sacrifice and some form of suffering in this world. Just remember that's that is precisely what we are called to some sort of suffering. We're called, number one, to sacrifice. We're called, number one, to go all out for Jesus. But that's going to result in some form of suffering. But that's our business as Christians. We're not here to reform the world. We're here to be holy. Oh yeah, our presence should make the world a better place. But we're not here to reform a fallen world. We're here to be holy. And we're here to suffer for that holiness if need be. And by that, testify to the reality of Jesus Christ. As we patiently endure, some will wonder how 
and why we do it. And that's when we have an opportunity to tell them about Jesus. We can say, listen, I know what I'm doing. I'm living to please the one who saved me by his death on the cross. 15. But in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. In other words, when we talk about Christ, we have to be kind. We should not respect a sinner's lifestyle, but we should respect the sinner. They are created in the image of God and therefore should be treated with dignity. Shock and awe are not good evangelism tools. The word of God and kindness are what God uses. 16. Keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. In other words, don't give the enemies of Christ ammunition to use against you. Obey God and consequently keep a clear conscience. Don't repay evil for evil. Someone does bad to us, we respond by doing bad to them. That messes up our conscience, that messes up our testimony. Plus, it gives the enemies of Christ ammunition to use against us, and worse, use against him. See, they represent Christ, but look at how bad they are. Look what they do. I guess Christianity isn't the answer. I guess Jesus isn't the answer. We have to be careful not to give the enemies of Christ any ammunition to use against him. 17. It is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. It's not a question of it's not a it's not a question of will we or will we not suffer as Christians. The question is will we suffer for doing wrong? Or will we do right and therefore share in the sufferings of Christ? Suffering for doing wrong leads to misery. Sharing in the sufferings of Christ leads to peace and joy. 18. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. <clears throat> he was put to death in the body but made alive by the Spirit. Talk about suffering for doing the will of God. That's exactly what Jesus did. God doesn't want anyone to go to hell, so Jesus paid for our sins on the cross. Jesus was completely innocent, and yet he suffered and died. He did it because it was the Father's will. He did it for us. He took our place so that those who trust in his sacrifice can be saved. And we'll pick it up right here next time. Until then, so long, everyone.